Hello and welcome back. So today I want to talk to you about research statements and this is a really important tool in order to get hired in academia. So here's a setting. You are maybe a student who is graduating this year so you should be defending in spring or maybe you'll defend in the summer and you need a job but the application season starts now. So you are starting to see some deadlines coming up in October and November for various postdoctoral positions. Or maybe you're somebody who is in a postdoctoral position and you want to apply to an assistant professor position. And again, these are positions that are coming up right now and deadlines are starting to accumulate through October and all the way up into about January. So you need to get this done quick and you need to get it done now. And so I want to talk to you about the general structure of research statements and their idea. And on a very light level, they're about your research, but more than anything, they're about marketing. So I'm going to talk to you about some of these ideas and I want to show you some examples of what I did for my research statements. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So what is a research statement? So in some level, it's about your research and it's gonna be about the things that you've done as a graduate student or postdoc, and you wanna basically put it into about three pages and send that off as attached to your job. Then people on the other side will look at your research statement along with your cover letter and your teaching statement, and then they'll decide whether or not they want to interview you. And so you need your research statement in order to get through that first door to get to an interview, but it's not exactly clear on what really needs to go into a research statement. So let's talk about the goals and what a hiring committee is actually looking for. So if as a postdoc, you're not really worried about a hiring committee, you're worried about a faculty supervisor. So somebody who does research that you are interested in getting into, and you need to make sure you sculpt your research statement to sort of fit their program. They want to look at you and, and see whether or not you can fit into the things that they want to do. So for instance, they're going to have a whole research program already going and they want to kind of get you up to speed on what they're doing as sort of a training but they also want you to publish and if it takes you too long to publish maybe it might not be a good fit so if you're only going to be a postdoc there for one year then they're going to they're going to want you to dash right out of the gate but if it's maybe a three-year postdoc then they might be okay with you learning some things along the way and maybe taking a, maybe a year in order to learn something completely new. For me, that's what it was. I went into a, a postdoctoral position where I didn't know anything about the field. So I went from a pure mathematics doing functional analysis into an engineering position where I was doing nonlinear control theory. It took me about a year before I was able to be able to actually produce anything. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you look at their program and make sure that you can make it look like you fit in there and don't lie about anything but make it clear that you know some of the things that they're working on and that it wouldn't take you too long to get up to speed and so what they're looking for is they are looking to make sure that you can be successful working underneath them because having a postdoc is actually a big investment and it's also something that they want to perform well on too so they're going to want to hire you in and they want to see you go on to a professor position or some other position that you want when you leave so they want to make sure you're going to be successful and that's why you need to sculpt a research statement to that particular professor's research program now for a faculty position it is a little bit different you're going to be trying to pitch yourself as somebody who can fit with well within the department it depends on what the department's looking for so first of all make sure that you're applying for the sort of thing that they're asking for but at the same time you also want to demonstrate that you can fit with the different professors in the department so if there is a big analysis group like there was at my university i also made sure in my research statement to highlight the sort of operator theory and functional analysis stuff that I do that would be compatible with the things that was already going on at the university. So that way if I need a collaborator there's going to be some people who are available there that can work with me. And at the same time I needed to demonstrate to the chair that I was going to be a good investment and that I was going to get tenure. You want to make sure that they think that you're going to have tenure right when they hire you. And what this means is that you can both get research done and bring in grant money. And so in my research statement for a, an assistant professor position, a big part of that was to demonstrate that I know where to find money. So I mentioned a few things about funding agencies and what they're looking for. And then the rest of it is really making sure that you're making a good pitch. So the first page of your research statement should be 
Uh, the first three paragraphs should really come down to like, this is everything I do, this is why I care about it, and get everything about your research statement into those three paragraphs. And then everything else is gonna more or less build off of that. And so if you have a hiring committee that's working really fast and they don't have time to read every three page research statement or sometimes five page research statements, they can just read the first couple paragraphs and get an idea of who you are and whether or not they wanna continue. And on the first page, you can talk about the things that you've done, but after that, you really want to focus on your future directions. So this is where it's going to be really important when you're talking about working with uh, somebody as a postdoc. You want to show that you have their research program in mind and you know have an idea of how to pursue uh, a sort of collaboration between stuff that you know how to do and the things that they know how to do. And when it comes to a faculty position, you want to talk about the things that you have on the burner and things that you anticipate taking your program into. Because they, again, they wanted to make sure that you're gonna have tenure. So they wanna make sure you have a research program in mind. And so that means that you need to come in with a plan of, you know, I'm gonna pursue this direction and it's gonna bring, you know, funding in from this spot. And then on the other hand, you want to, you know, talk about maybe another side program that you have going on. So I had four thrusts to my research program but they're all sort of overlapped so i tried to integrate and intertwine them as best i could so i'll give you a few examples of few things i said in my research statement and maybe that can help you get started so take a look in here uh, this is my first two paragraphs and so in here i'm saying i divided my research program into what i called four pillars so the four pillars of my research program are really you know talking about numerical analysis optimal control fractional order systems and formal methods and applied to and formal methods applied to several physical systems now now actually this doesn't represent my research program anymore uh, but at the time i was working in formal methods and so this was very much on my mind I still work a lot on fractional order systems and I still do a lot of numerical analysis. The optimal control, I still work on here and there, but it's really been taking sort of backseat for sort of the machine learning methods and dynamical systems, this DMD stuff that you've seen on my other videos. And, and then, so I take those guys and then I try to put it under a central theme. So I have the umbrella of using reproducing kernel hover spaces to approach all of these, uh, all these problems. And so, Numerical, so reproduce kernel hover spaces are at the core of numerical methods I develop. So, you know, you can basically talk about scattered data interpolation and, and then also all these occupation kernels that I use uh, throughout here. And I go on and I talk about a few other things according to my actual research program. But in the highlighted bit here, I said underscoring the importance of this subject is the fact that each of the major funding agencies, so AFOSR, uh, you know, ARO, DOD in general, NSF, uh, they, each of them uh, have specific programs targeting the development and applications of formal methods. So I'm trying to tell them that, look, there are places I can send this information to. Now, now that I've actually been a professor for a little while and I have funding, if I was rewriting this statement, I in that highlighted spot, I will say exactly where I've gotten the money from. So in this case, I have gotten about $750,000 from AM4SR, and I've gotten about another $300,000 from NSF. And altogether, I've gotten about $1.7 million. I'm a, rather, I'm a co-PI or PI on $1.7 million of grant funding, federal grant funding, uh, that's split between me and two other colleagues. And so then I go on in the next paragraph and I talk about how my research leverages my experience as an applied analyst. So I'm trying to like say that I'm an applied mathematician, but I'm also a mathematical analyst. Uh, and so this was one of the uh, research statements I would send to a group that was looking for more machine learning or uh, applied mathematics. If I was sending to a pure mathematical thing, I would rewrite this and pitch myself as a pure mathematician who do also does some applied mathematics. And so here I'm saying that uh, my research focus has been on the development of problem-specific basis functions for machine learning, optimal control, approximation theory, and operator theory. My research aims to reduce the dimensionality of a machine learning problem either through the use of local data or through the consolidation of a continuum of data points into a single basis vector. And so again, this feeds into my occupation kernels uh, right there at the very end. And so this, uh, what really is meant to, in these two paragraphs, give everybody an idea of who I am, how I intend to get money, 
and the general problems I work on. And so with, if somebody read only these two paragraphs, they'd have a basic idea of the kind of person I am. They won't have any serious details, but they would know that I do kernel spaces and I do applied mathematics. I work on optimal control theory and some formal methods. That, that's what they would take away. I threw in some hot word, uh, you know, some some buzzwords in there like fractional order systems. People really love that right now. Optimal control, a lot of people work on optimal control. And numerical analysis is also uh, a nice topic too. So let's take a look at some other bits from my research statement. So the rest of this, so I, I go on and I talked about some of the things I've done already, uh, but then I talk about future directions. Now these future directions, I chose to be kind of the things I'm working on right at that moment, because those are the things I conceptualize the best, but also some other more speculative things at, at the very end. So I want to lead with more concrete items while the reader is still more or less coherent before they sort of fuzz out and stop paying attention. And so here I talked about optimal, occupation kernels for optimal control. So uh, if you've been watching my channel, you've seen me talk about op occupation kernels for machine learning and, and data science, but I haven't talked about it on the control theory side that much. And so we actually got the idea for designing occupation kernels from occupation measures, which were used in occupation and optimal control theory and, and all that stuff. And so later we went and, uh, and, and generalized occupation measures to something a little bit more uh, flexible, which were these occupation kernels. And so then basically, I ha and then if we take a look at the second item here, we see that the developments of occupation kernels will have a dramatic impact in the literature surrounding occupation measures. It not only provides greater theoretical flexibility, but it also allows for more detailed requirements to be placed on the resultant optimal controller than are currently available for occupation measures. So. If I saw this in a manuscript, I would, you know, tell somebody to just rewrite that entire bit and get it out of there. And I tell this to my graduate students, and you know who you are if uh, if you're watching this video right now. You don't want to talk. You don't want to use flourishy languages in a manuscript. That is a big no-no. You want to stick to the science and report exactly what happened. But adding like you know, it'll have a dramatic impact is is too much. However, if you're writing a grant or you're writing a research statement, which really isn't all that different from a grant proposal, then you are going to want to jazz yourself up. You want to get people excited about what you're working on, and you want to. And since these aren't going to necessarily be people who do what you do, you want to make sure that they know where that impact is going to be coming from. It, you might know your research forwards and backwards, but they don't. And so you need to highlight exactly what you did and why accomplishing what you did was good. And so in this case, I'm telling them this is my plan and this is why it's a really good plan. And so then you see other things about these tra trajectory kernel functions. We actually abandoned uh, that terminology. We don't use that anymore. And, um, and then you see the beginnings of these occupation kernels. This is right when we were starting to first figure out how to use them. And so, so yeah, so that, that, that was fun. Um, so then I concluded in one of the you know closing paragraphs, I said, leveraging this new class of kernel function will allow for a tremendous number of applications beyond verification. And so here I'm trying to, again, pitch like this is how, why people should be excited. And suddenly this is kind of where money can come from too. So these application areas include medical imaging and the detection of aberration of behavior in biological and artificial systems, contour interpolation and geology, image compression, and many others. And for each of these fields, uh, existing methods that leverage reproduce kernel helper spaces and radial basis functions in particular generate an unnecessarily large number of center points and have exceedingly large dimensionality. And so I was trying to show that we can consolidate a lot of data into a single trajectory and use that uh, as our approximation. I don't know if I'd make that pitch anymore. Uh, this isn't really kind of how I think about them anymore. But back then, this is what's my mindset. and. Uh, and a lot of these applications are pretty cool. Um, there is definitely some stuff you can do in medical imaging, and we've already done some work in tomography. And image compression is something that I'm still working on with, with these, and you know, if somebody wants to collaborate on that, I'm certainly open to it. And uh, yeah, in any case, but this is, more or less gives you a few highlights out of my research statement. My research statement itself ended up being about four pages, which is a little bit long. 
and so you should really keep it down to three pages if possible. And make sure you, you highlight uh, all those important areas. You want to make sure that you, they are convinced that you will perform well, so have a plan for when you're coming in. And they want to know you can, you, or you, and so they want to know you can get tenure to a faculty member or that you can reasonably find a job afterwards because you've already had a plan and ready to go as a postdoc. And so, so yeah, so th this is uh, the the general approach that I take to writing a research statement. Uh, let me know if you, you like this in this video, and uh, you know if you if you did like this video, I have other professional development videos I can talk about. Uh, so subscribe and you know please come back. But if there's more details you wanted about the research statement in particular, please comment below and let me know if there's more I can add. In any case, so thank you for watching, and well I'll see you next time.